bought me another 30 minutes, so <laughs> I want to thank you for that, brother. <laughs> I probably need it with what I have prepared to share with you today. And uh, I've shared with you many times in the past that it's a distinct honor and privilege to stand before you and share with you the gospel. It still is simply amazing to me that God would call me to be a pastor. In the book of Jeremiah, the Bible says, I've given you pastors according to my heart. And I want to tell you that I don't think there's any question that God called me. It's not my goal or desire when I started out as a young man in life. But God had a different plan for me, and here I stand over 40 years later, still just blessed in the call. You know, I've titled the message this morning, The Formula for Finishing Well. I've, I've shared these verses and probably preached them then in the past here in this church as I approached my 16th year. Um, I'm sure I've shared a message or two from these verses. I'm going to ask you to turn to your Bible in sec or 2 2 Timothy chapter 4. I told you I've had talks with my sons, and I said, you guys make sure at my funeral that these verses are read. And then if there's anything you can say about that, say he finished his race. He stayed the course. Very meaningful to me. If there's anything that can be said about me when I'm gone, it's that I was faithful to the call that the Lord placed on my life. As I look out across this congregation, Many of you, like myself, are almost 16 years older than when I first met you. <laughs> and many of us are getting close to the finish line. Over there, Brother Pete, look around without calling out any names. And there comes a point where God says, come home. Many of us are getting closer to that day. We don't know when it will be, and by God's grace, we'll still have many years left. But we're getting close. And the question is, that I want to put out in the congregation today, is are you doing what's necessary to finish well? Are you doing what's necessary to leave the kind of legacy that when the people stand and talk about you, when your family stands to talk about you, your children talk about you, what will they say? Are you doing what's necessary? You know, I, I love sports. I, I just do. I always have. I've been very much involved in sports. In fact, when I was writing this sermon, I started getting so pumped up, I, I had to call Brad. He's He's the guy that I trained back 40 years ago when we were fighting and actually had some fights on ESPN. And I was just so pumped up in it. There's probably no two people that are farther apart in our worldview, in our politics, in our philosophies on life. But we still love each other, even though we're completely far apart because of what brought us together and and caused us to bond at that time in our life. And that was over <clears throat> boxing, full contact karate. We were kind of the precursor to what now is known as the MMA. And uh, so it was just a great time. I know I don't talk about that a lot because some of you, when I've talked about it, got upset if you didn't want to hear it as a preacher actually hit people. But that's what you got to do in the boxing ring. And when you're working out with a guy like Brad, I'm telling you, if you ain't ready to hit back, you're going to get knocked 
knocked out. So we were talking about some of the fights, reliving some of that, and I thought, you know, I just, I just can't get over the fact that a lot of work has to go into finishing the wild. You know, for those of us who were alive in 1980 and old enough to remember the Winter Olympics that year, um, we witnessed probably one of the greatest moments in sports history on February 22nd, 1980. My first child was under a month old. He, he was born on the 29th of January. On the 22nd of February in 1980, the USA defeated Russia in an ice hockey game to advance to the gold medal round. Russia came in to the Winter Games as a four-time Olympic gold medal champion. Nobody could beat the Russians. We had uh, a game with them in about two weeks before the Olympics began when the, their ice hockey came back here in Madison Square Garden and they killed us. They smoked us. They made us look like the amateurs that we were. But calling the game for ABC Sports was a young sports announcer by the name of Al Michaels. And as the game wound down to the final seconds, and it became apparent that the USA was about to pull off the greatest upset in sports history at that time, Michaels uttered the quote heard around the world. He said, do you believe in miracles? The answer, yes. It was a phenomenal finish. In fact, I'm going to ask you to dim the lights. I'm going to show you the last minute of that game.
see many examples of these faithful finishes in the Bible. Under God's direction, Noah built an ark and delivered his family in the animal kingdom to this side of the flood. Moses delivered the Israelites safely to the promised land. Elijah called down fire from heaven, and for the only time ever, listen to this, you guys should get it, wet wood was lit on fire. And you guys know I often say if that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet, because wet wood doesn't burn unless Elijah calls it down from heaven and God sends the fire that burns it all up. Enoch walked with God and then he was gone. God took him up in the world. Jesus left the splendor of heaven and took the sins of the world upon himself. And he paid the penalty for our sin. And when it was finished, he went back home. The Apostle Paul, in the twilight of his ministry, encourages his protege, Timothy, to finish well. And he says to Timothy, I have finished my course. In essence, Paul is saying to Timothy, I'm handing you the baton to run with. My departure has come. Let me show you what Paul says to Timothy. If you'll stand as we honor the Lord in the reading of his word, Matthew chapter 4. I said Matthew, I was meaning 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse number 5. 2 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 5. But watch in all things. In your affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearance. Heavenly Father, we are blessed, so blessed, as the song said that we sang this morning, we are so blessed to be able to come into your presence, to know that you hear us, to know, Lord, that you care about us, to know that you take care of us. And so God, today I ask that as we spend a little time together as brothers and sisters in Christ, that you will anoint me with your spirit, even as you did the Lord Jesus Christ when he said the spirit of God is upon me as he walked into the synagogue to preach your word. Would you speak through me for your glory and honor? For the praise of the people. May we see Christ high and lifted up. God, we love you. And we know that we can only love you because you first love us. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus said, Go ye therefore, it was not a commission to start the race, it was a command to finish the race. I heard Dr. Roger Spratlin share his personal story in a message years ago. He said that when he was a student at Oklahoma Baptist University, that one of the school's alumni led in the chapel service on a particular day. And in that message, the pastor was John Visago, actually a very well-known pastor if you look him up. And he 
he shared this personal story. He said while he was attending OBU, preparing for the ministry, he met a girl who would later become his wife. And his father-in-law then told him, his father-in-law again was a pastor, and told him, he said, Johnny, you need to be careful to guard your life, and particularly your spiritual life. Out of 20 young men just like you, starting out in ministry, all but one will make it to the end. By not making it what the Sagdo's father-in-law told, told him when he met, was that some kind of discouragement, some kind of moral failure, some kind of disillusionment, some kind of bitterness would push those people out of ministry. The Sagdo said, I didn't believe it. So I wrote down the names of 24 of my classmates on the inside leaves of my Bible. And he said, over the years, one by one, I'll scratch their names off that list for a number of reasons. And he held up his Bible and he said, there are only three names left. As I have run my race, I'm not surprised. I have seen over the many years of ministry, many pastors, many deacons, many church members that have fallen, and for one reason or another, disqualified themselves from ministry or have completely left the church. The point is, we are good at starting. We are good at starting many things. We're just not good at finishing them. Look in your garage of all the projects you started and never finished. We're good at doing that. In our text today, the Apostle Paul sends this message to young Timothy. He is in essence saying, finish well, son. He says, make full proof of your ministry. Paul puts his own life on display in these verses that we read here today. And in doing that, I believe we can glean at least three critical ingredients to finishing well. And I want to share that with you. And there's a lot of information I have to share with you. So I'm going to go quickly and uh, pray that you stay with me. Ingredient number one is to focus on forgiveness. <clears throat> Sometimes our very best laid plans can turn into a fiasco. Feelings can get hurt, people can get offended, and in Paul's life, he was no exception. If he's going to finish well now, he had to forget and deal with the fiasco that occurred on his first missionary journey. To focus on forgiveness, one must forget the offense. He says in our text, wash in all things. Most of you probably know the story of Paul. He had recently been saved, meaning he had come to faith in the Lord Jesus. He had proven by example that his life changed because of Christ was authentic. Initially there were some questions about that that people were afraid of him because of his reputation. But now he's at a point of place where they believe that the transformation that takes place in the life of a Christian is real. I've said this to you many times in the past, I have to be careful to stay on task here, but if you say you've come to the Lord Jesus Christ and there's no change in your life, you better revisit 
your salvation experience. Because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You cannot be the same person that you were before salvation after you're saved. And Paul understood that, and Paul's life had radically changed, and he's at a point in place where he's on fire for the Lord, and he's ready to tell everyone about it, so he decides to go on a mission trip to share the gospel. It's what the New Testament church is supposed to do. We're supposed to be on fire to share the gospel. And whether that takes us to the neighborhoods around us or to a farther mission field, it's our responsibility to share the gospel. And that's where Paul was. So he puts together a mission team that includes Barnabas and John, Mark. First name John, last name Mark. We read in Acts chapter 12 and verse number 25 that Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem where they'd been, when they fulfilled their ministry there, then they took with them John, whose surname or last name was Mark. And they're about ready to journey out on, a, on the very first church planting missionary trip that, that Paul went, at, went on, and along the way, Mark quits the team. He bailed out on them, and he returns home. We read in Acts 13 and verse 13, Now when Paul and his company, or his group, set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, then John departed from them and he went back to Jerusalem. This creates a problem. We don't know the reasons why Mark went back home. We don't know if he was too young to be on the trip initially. If he was homesick, if he was afraid, if he couldn't take the pressure, whatever the reason was, we don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. But we do know that it created a problem such that on the second missionary journey, when Paul's about to go on the second missionary journey, he refused to let Mark go with him. And this issue escalated in the ministry team of Paul and Barnabas broke up over this issue. And so Barnabas and Mark go one way, Paul and Silas go another way. We read in Acts chapter 15 and verse 36 and following, and after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return now and visit the brethren in every city where we proclaim the word. What he's saying is, let's go back and check on the churches that we planted. So let us return now and visit the brethren in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. And Barnabas was of a mind to take with them John, who's called Mark, but Paul thought it not good to take with them him who withdrew from them in Pamphylia. And so he didn't go with them, and there arose a sharp contention so that they parted ways. Barnabas took Mark with him, sailed away to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas. And went another way. And so we have a very clear biblical example of contention to the point of separation between brothers in Christ. And here's Paul now at the end of his life, right? With Timothy. Paul was a winner. He was used to finishing what he started. He had no patience or place for quitters. Mark was a quitter. Quitters were an offense to Paul. But at the end of his life, he realizes that 
that if it's going to finish well, he needs to deal with that issue. He needs to make things right with Mark and forget about the fiasco that took place on that first missionary trip. Letting go of the offense allows you to forgive the offender. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 11, just a few verses down, Paul says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with you. Isn't it interesting that all these years later, Paul didn't quit on Mark. It was the other way around. Paul didn't hurt or offend Mark. It was the other way around. Paul didn't break a promise or renege on a commitment to Mark. It was the other way around. Nevertheless, it's Paul who's reaching out to Mark. I wonder if you get the message here. Paul's in a prison cell. Soon his life will be ended and he knows it. He's reflecting back on his life. No doubt still bothered by this issue with Mark. And so he reaches out to him. Let me ask you, who's hurt you? Who's offended you? Who broke a promise to you? Who quit on you? If you want to finish well, you need to let today be the day that you resolve the contention. Let go of the hurt. Let go of the bitterness. And reach out to that person. Paul teaches us the need to feverishly enlist fellowship. He says, only Luke is with me there in verse 11 of chapter 4, 2 Timothy. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with you. Now listen to this. For he is useful to me in ministry. Paul says, Mark has value, and he's useful to me. He might have blown it years ago, but he's still useful. I wonder how many of us might have blown it years ago, but God says you're still useful. Praise God for that, amen. You're still useful. Perhaps Paul followed Mark's ministry throughout the years. Maybe he watched him from a distance and, and saw him mature and grow up and grow past that first missionary journey. Maybe Barnabas did a great job mentoring Mark, not giving up on him. And Paul witnessed that from a distance. Maybe Paul just wanted to be surrounded by Christian brothers as he neared the end of his life and felt that fellowship with Mark would be a great ministry to him. Whatever the reason, Paul says to Timothy, bring Mark along. Isn't that a great lesson about forgiveness? These guys had such contention years earlier that they couldn't even go together on a mission trip. They couldn't minister together. You get a sense that they didn't want anything to do with each other. How sad is it that men and women of God can create or allow that kind of dissension between ourselves that we can't even minister together. But at the end of Paul's life, he said, we got to fix it. So he says to Timothy, bring Mark. He's useful. He's beneficial. I'm forgetting the fiasco. I'm forgiving the offender. I'm enlisting the fellowship of a brother. I can't think 
of a more joyous position to be in as we near the end of the race than to be surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ. So who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to make things right with to finish well? You know, in some cases, I believe it might be you that needs to forgive you. God has forgiven us, right? Isn't that what salvation is all about? All of our sins have been forgiven. Christ took them to the cross. He paid the penalty for sin. And so God forgives us of our sin when he saves us. But sometimes I think we get hung up on the fact that we blew it so bad that we can't move past that point. And Satan has a way of accusing you every day. He accuses you according to scripture to God himself. One of my favorite encouraging verses is found in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 10, where the scripture says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. Now this is John saying, you know what? I heard a loud voice. That means that it is undeniable. And I heard this voice saying, now it's come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren. I wonder who that is, brother. That's Satan. The accuser of our brethren is cast down. Glory, hallelujah. Satan is getting the boot permanently. The accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. Let me ask you, if Satan has the audacity to accuse you day and night before holy God, do you think he's not going to sit on your shoulder and tell you what a loser you are? Tell you how bad you've messed up? Tell you there's nothing redeemable about you? Of course he's going to do that. But in Christ we have been redeemed. Yeah. And praise God we have value. Not because of anything we've done or because there's a righteousness about us, but Christ is righteous. And he said it. So praise be to God that we can forget the fiasco, that we can forgive the offender, even if it's us, that we can enlist the fellowship of a brother and finish our course. Ingredient number two to finishing well is to focus on the course. Satan is good at knocking us off balance, knocking us off course by multiple distractions. Paul compared him to a wrestling match when he wrote to the brethren at Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12, he says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That would be an easy match, wouldn't it? Because you see your opponent. But Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul compared Satan's tactics to a street brawl in his letter to Timothy. He says, focus on the fire. If we're going to stay locked in on the course, then we have to learn to fight a good fight. Now Paul says in verse 7, just that. He said, I fought a good fight. 
as he speaks these words, he's most likely reflecting on his life. By worldly standards, Paul threw away the prospect of a bright future. And by worldly standards, he became a loser. He was well educated and possibly could have become a renowned rabbi. However, Brother Paul chose to follow the call that God put on his life. And so now he looks back on the course that his life has taken. He looks back on the beatings, on the stoning, on the shipwrecks, on the ridicule, on the imprisonment, and he said, you know what? I fought a pretty good fight. Dude, I wish we could all say that. I think we all should aspire to be able to say that. As Paul reflects back on his life, he did this in writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 24 and following. He says of the Jews five times, I received 40 stripes minus one. That means five beatings where he endured and encountered 39 <coughs> lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A day and night I've been in the deep, meaning in the water, just hoping I don't drown. In travel, many times, in peril, that word comes from a Greek word that means danger. He says, I've been in danger in the water, I've been in danger by robbers. I've been in danger by my own countrymen. I've been in danger by the heathen. I've been in danger in the city. I've been in danger in the wilderness. I've been in danger in the sea. I've been in danger among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness. In watching, which when you look at the up the Greek word on that, it just means to keep awake, it means sleep deprivation. Often in hunger, that means scarcity of food, and in thirst, in fasting, when there are two different definitions there, but what he's using here is intentional withholding of food. So, in the times when he was in prison, he was also he said in cold and nakedness and besides all those things that are without that which comes only daily which is the care of all the churches Paul said you know what I find a good fight does it take you to some holy ghost Looking back on all this, Paul says, uh, or when he says, I fought a good fight, it brings about a respect for him. There is a sense of spiritual maturity about what he's saying. It kind of makes us in us. Unless we can say the same thing and say we're on par, with this life, it makes a little bit envious that he was able to say at the end of his life all those things. I handled them all. I dealt with them all. I endured them all. I thought it was a good time. You want to finish well? You want to fight a good fight. Focusing on the course means to ferociously claim to the faith. Not only did Paul say, I fought a good fight, he said, I've kept the faith. The word kept 
It comes from the Greek word tereo, and it means to properly guard from loss or injury. When he says, I've kept the faith, what he's saying is that I have guarded what God has entrusted to me. Folks, I want to tell you God has entrusted much to you. God has entrusted much to me. Topping that list is my family, my kids, and now my grandkids, all entrusted to me. On some level, while I may not have the same influence on my grandkids that I had on my children, I still have a responsibility as much as I can to share with them the precious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a blessing it's been. There's three of my grandchildren who were baptized right here. Four of the five now have all made professions of faith. And we pray earnestly for Andrew. Paul said, I've kept the faith. I've guarded that which God has entrusted to me. But to hone it down where he says, I've kept the faith, what he's saying is that I was given a sacred treasure. Now, I want you to hear me and hear me well right now. Because if you are a child of the king, you have been given a sacred treasure. Paul says it's a gift from God. I wonder what he's talking about. Well, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. There's that word. And that, what is that? That faith is not of yourself. It is a gift of God. We have a sacred treasure given to us by God, by His grace, we've been saved through Christ, because we have a faith that He has given to us. And Paul said, I've got that faith. I've guarded that faith. I have protected that faith. I've kept it from loss or injury. You know, there are folks that come into the church on fire. They're going to get involved in some ministry. They're going to make a difference for the Lord. They're going to turn the world upside down. They're going to save everybody. They come in like that. I heard about a pastor who graduated from seminary and he starts out on his ministry and he says, Lord, I just want you to know that I'm going to flip this world upside down for you. God, I only ask two things from you. One, that you give me a pretty little wife and a great big church. Somebody said to him at the end of his ministry, did God answer your prayer? He said, almost. He gave me a great big wife and a pretty little church. <laughs> It'll sink in. <clears throat> the point is that there are people who are on fire. They come in and they want to disrupt everything and change everything, and then something happens along the way. And they don't just quit on the church. They quit on God. I want to tell you, beginners are a dime a dozen. Finishers are jewels. What Paul seems to say, God has been faithful in all things. So I faithfully trust Him. When things didn't make sense, I still anchored my faith. When things got tough, my faith got tough. I have 
guarded that sacred, precious gift that God gave you. Remember, there are fans that fortify. After he says, I fought a good fight, I've kept the faith, in verse 7, and he says, I've finished my course. I've finished my race. You know, in a marathon, most of the race takes place outside the stadium. When it starts, you leave the stadium, and then you run most of the race in obscurity. Not to the applause of the crowd, but to the pounding of your feet on the pavement for over 26 miles. Yet, there is an applause as you near the end of the long, grueling race because the design of the marathon is such that it brings you back into the stadium at the end of the race. The stadium filled with fans. And suddenly you hear the cheer of the crowd. If you've ever done anything in sports, you know that the cheer of the crowd can fortify you. It can help you get that last little oomph you need to get the pen or to accomplish whatever your task is at that moment. The Christian life is like running a marathon. If you quit, you never get to hear is, or experience the roar of the crowd. It's easy to run the Christian life when you're enjoying the panoramic views from the mountain top. When we soar like eagles, oh, eagles, eagles aloft in the blessing of the Lord. So we're like eagles. Make sure you don't misquote me. So we're like eagles. A lot. In the blessing of the Lord. It's easy when we're basking in God's presence and they in His love. But it's not so easy and we're overcome with grief and bow down and sorrow. And our life has been turned upside down. And we've suffered a great loss. I look out across this congregation and know stories of some of your personal lives. And the loss you suffer. It's not easy then keep our in grace. But the writer of Hebrews reminds us that the grandstands are filled with cheering fans that will fortify you along the way. Let me share with you Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. It says, Wherefore, seeing that we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, folks, that's the fan. That are, that's the uh, men and women of God that have gone before us. That's the saints of old that are in the stands cheering you on. Wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every way and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. There is no better place to fix your eyes than on the Lord Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I have kept the faith, Paul said. And here we learn again that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Glory, hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. 
Keep your eyes trained on the prize. <laughs> number three, I think we're going to make it. Ingredient number three to finishing well is to focus on the finish. <laughs> Nobody enters the competition, I believe. Nobody does. Maybe I'm wrong on this. To just get a participation award. I mean, I've never entered any competition <laughs> to get a participation award. Dude, I wanted to win. I wanted to gold medal. Nobody enters a competition to get a participation award or even to take second place. You begin something with the goal to finish it and to win it. There is a prize to claim. And Paul mentions that to Timothy in verse number 8. He says, henceforth, verse number 8 of chapter 4, he says, henceforth, meaning now and going forward, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. There is a crown of righteousness. There's a prize called the crown of righteousness, which the Lord's going to give me on that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. To all of them. So are you looking forward to the appearing and the coming of our Lord Jesus? I've often shared with you that the Bible speaks distinctly of three crowns. Bob wrote not too long ago about five crowns, and I looked it up and I thought, I can't tell him this, but I think he's right. So, I'm going to tell you the Bible speaks of five crowns. Listen to me closely. The first is the incorruptible crown. This is given to those concentrating on winning the race. You read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Second is the crown of rejoicing. And this is given for the fruit of our labor. You read about that in Philippians 4, 1 and 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 19 and 20. There is the crown of life given to those who remain faithful under persecution and temptation. And you can read about that in James chapter 1 and verse number 12 and again in Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10. There's the crown of glory given to pastors whose motives are pure and leadership of the flock is in step with God's direction. And it denotes the never fading, ever flourishing reward given by Christ himself. You can read about that in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 4. And number 5 is the crown of righteousness, which Timothy speaks of. And this is given to those who look for and long for the return of Christ. It denotes the victor's prize for enduring faithfully, for running with distinction, and for finishing well for the cause of Christ. And that's right here in 2 Timothy. It's Paul writing in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse number 8. I want to tell you this. The Bible also speaks of a crown of all. And Jesus wore that crown so that we could wear the crown of righteousness crown of glory, the crown of life, the crown of rejoicing, the incorruptible crown. There is a prize at the finish line. Keep your eye on it. At the finish line, there are words to hear. Some people destroy others with their words. I've been writing about that in my trumpet articles. And maybe one more to go on that. But let me say this. The words that we hear at the finish line will be prized words. Let me share a few of them with you. We find in 
Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 34, then the king will say unto them on his right hand, come. Come. That's one word. Isn't it great? He's going to say come. Bob, come. Jim, come. Patrick, come. That's what king's going to say. Come. You blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Inherit speaks to an inheritance that we get because we are joint heirs with Christ. In Matthew 25 and verse number 21, his Lord said unto him, Well done. Don't you long for the day when you hear well done? Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter. Enter into the joy of the Lord. What I want to tell you is that what you're going to hear at the finish line is the Lord Jesus. Say, come on in. Last, there is a mansion to inherit. I used the word procure. I thought let's get that question and use the word inherit. It's probably a little easier to understand. Procure means to take possession of, uh, and certainly we'll take possession of the um, mansion that the Lord built for us, but we're going to inherit it because he's giving it to us. So we sing that song, I've got a mansion over the hilltop, in that bright city where the ransom will shine, and someday yonder, we will never more wonder, but walk on streets that are pure as gold. We got a mansion, and we're going to get there by walking on the streets of gold. Jesus said in John the 14th chapter, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, for I love that, and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. There is a prize at the finish line. Keep your eye on it. And so here's the Apostle Paul. He's in a prison cell. Mentoring Timothy still. He's reaching out to Mark in reconciliation and fellowship. He's reflecting <coughs> on the race and on the fight and on the course. And the finish line is just ahead, and his eyes are on the prize. And the doors to the prison cell open. And in walks a big Roman soldier. And they drag Paul out, his hands and his feet are shackled. He walks slowly because age and beatings and stonings have taken their fall. His grace is almost over. Yet Paul's head is held high, and as much as is possible, his chest is puffed out. There's a faint smile on his face. The soldiers take him to the whipping post one more time. And they make him get down on his knees. And they beat his back one more time. And you can hear the moans. And you can see the blood. They pick him up. They stretch him out. And with one mighty blow, with a two-edged sword, they cut his head off. Taking in the cheers from heaven's grandson. And some might say, I wonder what Paul's last words were. And 
tell me in Finland, right here, where I was, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which God, the righteous judge, will give me. And not to me only, but to all of you are this apparent. Paul finished his course. He finished it well. Let me ask you, what do you need to do to put yourself on the course to finish well? Heavenly Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for the way you speak to us. It stirs our heart. It penetrates deeply into our soul. It challenges our faith. So God, I want to thank you for your word today. I trust that it has gone forth, that it's ministered to the hearts of each person who listened, and that on some level it inspired them to run the race and run it well, encouraged them to maybe address the issues in their life that require forgiveness and release. Perhaps on some level it's challenged us to fight a better fight. To take hold of the sacred gift of faith. And to finish our course. So God, as we take a few moments, being led in the music by our praise team, Cause us to respond to whatever you're doing in our life. That means we should come forward and kneel at an altar and just spend some time in prayer. Allow us to do that without fear or with courage that you're going to hear our prayer. Maybe where we stand, we need to pray. So God, in the next few moments, will you help us to reflect? I'm